today, the whole world moves on a thin film of lubricating oil. Oil is our magic carpet. Without it, no wheel could turn, no moving part operate. Delicate watches and ponderous engines. Watercraft and aircraft and automobiles. Trucks, buses, and tractors. Wherever there is motion, wherever power is made or used, there's oil. Lubricating oil separates spinning gears and metal parts. Lacking it, all moving mechanisms would soon grind to a stop. With it, they move smoothly, efficiently. To provide proper lubrication is not simple or easy. In this age of machines, many types of oil are needed, each to perform a special job. Only in a great modern refinery can these many types be perfected. Here, modern science keeps pace with the ever-increasing, ever more exacting needs for lubricating oil. So we come to the story of how we get it and what we do to it. The hero of our story is a typical lubricating oil molecule. He is called a hydrocarbon because he is made up of atoms of carbon and hydrogen joined together. Such molecules and countless other hydrocarbon molecules differing only in size and shape make up crude oil. These molecules are much too small to see even with the highest powered microscope but are tremendous in importance. Let's take our typical lubricating oil molecule and trace his career from the time science begins to prepare him for his role in our mechanized world. As with all petroleum products, lubricating oil comes from crude oil. Crude oil, a veritable black magic that is taken from the depths of the earth. The first step is that of separating the various types of molecules. This is accomplished at the refinery in the huge bubble towers of a pipe still by distillation. Here's a simplified diagram, and we really mean simplified, of a modern distillation unit. The crude oil is heated on the left, so hot that most of it is above its boiling point, and so it turns to vapor. It then goes to the bubble tower on the right. molecules are small. They have little tendency to condense from gas to liquid, and so they pass all the way up the tower and are taken out at the top. The next larger molecules are gasoline. They rise to the fourth level before they change from vapor back to liquid and are drawn off. The kerosene molecules have condensed on the next lower tray, and fuel oil on the one still lower. The unvaporized portion, known as reduced crude, is removed from the bottom of the tower and sent to a second still. A lubricating oil pipe still for the critical task of properly separating the lubricating oil molecules. High temperatures ordinarily required to distill these heavy molecules are avoided by the use of vacuum and steam. This bubble tower further separates the molecules into light, medium, and heavy distilled lube oil stocks. From the bottom of the tower is taken residual lube stock containing asphalt and other heavy materials. To keep things simple, we've shown just four types of lubricating oil molecules. As they come from the stills, other materials come along with them. And as so often happens in the best of families, these other members may be black sheep. Some of them have their uses, but not in lubricating oil. I'm asphalt. I'm wax. I form sludge and varnish. I get too thick at low temperatures and too thin at high temperatures. <laughs> I'm a color impurity. Under certain conditions, these black sheep will interfere with good lubrication. They must, therefore, be removed. 
We'll start by getting rid of asphalt, which has been concentrated in the residual stock that was taken off from the bottom of the second still. Asphalt is removed in units like this. The oil is diluted with a liquefied petroleum gas called propane, which has to be kept liquid by high pressure because of the temperature employed. The large asphalt molecules are not soluble in the warm propane diluted oil. They settle to the bottom and are drawn off. So the first steps in the refining process have been taken. The processes used from here on may be applied to distilled as well as residual oils. So for the sake of simplicity, let's combine the distilled stocks, then take the representative oil molecules that typify distilled and residual lubricating oil stocks, and consider them as one, a typical lubricating oil molecule the little character who is to be our hero for the remainder of the story. As we can see, undesirable companions are still following him around, and these undesirables will have to be removed before our hero can do his job properly. The purifying process continues with the removal of wax. Karam! A good little guy, except at low temperatures when he solidifies and blocks oil flow, he is removed in units like this. In these modern methods of de-waxing, a thinner or solvent is added to the oil. The thinner employed is liquefied propane, normally a gas, the same liquefied gas used in removing asphalt, but now at a much lower temperature. Here is how this solvent de-waxing works. The mixture, oil and propane, is chilled. This causes wax molecules to form solid particles, but the oil molecules remain liquid and easily pass through filters. The wax particles, which are solid, cannot pass and are trapped. In settling tanks, petrolatum, a different type of wax contained in the residual oils, is separated from the chilled mixture. Laboratory pour tests are continually run to make sure that the processes just described will produce oils that flow readily in cold weather. So, asphalt and wax are now gone, a good start in our refining process. The next two culprits to be dealt with are the character that forms sludge and varnish and the one that causes oil to thin excessively at high temperatures and thicken too much at low temperature. They may be removed along with part of the color by several processes. One is acid treatment. Sulfuric acid and oil are mixed together. By chemical reaction, acid particles hook on to the unwanted molecules, forming heavy sludge that settles out of the oil. Another method is solvent extraction, one of the most advanced processes, revolutionary in principle, making possible the attainment of new high standards in lubricating oil quality. In this process, a special solvent literally dissolves out unstable materials. It differs from acid treatment in that no chemical reaction is involved. The oil's high stability resulting from solvent extraction is checked by the Indiana Stirring Oxidation Test, which measures the oil's greatly improved resistance to attack by oxygen over long periods of time. To demonstrate another improvement obtained by solvent extraction, note that at room temperature, the falling balls show that these two oils have the same viscosity or body. But when they are chilled, the oil on the right thickens less, showing that its body is affected least by low temperatures. This resistance to change is one of the desirable characteristics that is found in oils with a high viscosity index called VI. 
Oils with high VI also better resist changes in body when heated. Thus, lubricating oil is improved in its VI with the removal of the unwanted molecules by the solvent extraction process. And now we have only one undesirable left. He's not so bad, but he does give oil a darker color. To remove him, a lubricating oil is treated with a powdered special type of clay. There's several ways to do this final cleanup. One is to pump through a filter oil and powdered clay that have been mixed together. Another way is the percolation process. The oil descends slowly by gravity through a deep bed of a special granular type of clay. Clay particles hold tightly onto the dark color impurities. The rest of the oil goes on through. The improved lighter color is checked for uniformity by comparison with official color standards. Now our hero, rid of his questionable companions by these purifying processes, is at last fit for lubricating service under all except the most severe conditions. Out of the refining processes you've seen have come all these oils. The rising bubbles indicate differences in body, and the various colors, differences in type. These oils and thousands more are especially fitted for the countless variety of lubrication jobs so essential to our modern mechanized world. Into service they go. Specific answers to a wide range of lubrication requirements, each one fitted to do a particular job. In industry and transportation, in devices at our homes, and in countless other ways. We know that on our farms, now highly mechanized, lubricating oil is extremely important in reducing friction, preventing wear and rusting, vitally helping the operation of all equipment. But to meet increasingly severe operating conditions, especially in motor cars, trucks, buses, and tractors, lubricating oils now need qualities that cannot be secured even by the best refining processes from oil alone. Scientists keeping pace with these new requirements have discovered that putting in special ingredients called additives, even in small amounts, makes lubricating oil work still better. For certain conditions, a poor point depressor, a viscosity index improver may be required in oils that transmit power. For example, in automatic transmissions, oils must not vary greatly in body at different temperatures. An anti-corrosion additive may be necessary to prevent corrosion of this type with the newer, harder bearings. An extreme pressure additive is used where the pressure is extremely high and there is considerable rubbing between steel to steel surfaces, as in high point gears. It forms on these surfaces a tightly bound protective film. An oiliness additive is used in mechanisms where the rubbing action requires an exceptionally strong film of oil. An antioxidant may be employed to protect oil at high temperature against the formation of sludge, varnish, and corrosive acids. A detergent dispersant may be added to prevent deposits such as these from collecting in oil passages, and to keep carbon and other deposits in a harmless, finely divided state dispersed in the oil. Anti-foam agents to prevent oils from foaming out of the equipment may sometimes be necessary. Other antioxidants and also metal deactivators may be used to counteract the tendency of certain metals that may be present to promote attack on the oil by oxygen. There are other additives for other special uses, and new additives are being developed continually as new needs arise. 
So now we see our fully finished lubricating oil molecule. When required, additives fit in to handle the toughest lubrication problems. Tested and retested every step of the way, our little lubricating oil molecule undergoes many final inspections before he is sent out to do his job. Like a fighter before his entry into the ring, the oil undergoes many final checks. Body or viscosity is tested by the Sabolt universal method or by the suspended level method. From his viscosity at various temperatures, his viscosity index or VI is calculated. Hydrometers are used to determine the gravity from which the weight per gallon may be calculated. The Cleveland Open Cup Flash Test is another of the common control tests. Another is the ability of the oil to separate from water. This is checked by the demulsibility test at specified temperatures using mechanical agitation. And by this test using steam. Tendency to form carbon is shown by this carbon residue test or by this more modern Ramsbottom method. An excellent check on carbon forming tendency is obtained by distilling the oil under a high vacuum and collecting and measuring the combustion residue formed in the engine is of course the ultimate test. Service in the field is, after all, the best way to prove the practical worth of a product. That is why the products of the research and development laboratories must also pass service tests before they offered for sale. All lubricating oils, and this includes power plant and industrial types, and all automotive types must prove themselves on the firing line of practical use. So our little hero proves his fitness, proves he can take punishment. Months of severe performance are now compressed into a few hours by the use of ingenious speed-up tests. The ability of an extreme pressure lubricant to protect metal against scoring in service is checked quickly with special test machines. A test like this in an actual passenger car high point rear axle telescopes months of service into hours and really proves the merit of a high point gear lubricant. This severe endurance test in an actual engine judges the ability of an oil to prevent or remove deposits in high speed diesel and automobile engines. Afterwards, parts are examined for deposits, ring sticking and wear. Another severe endurance test in an actual engine determines the oil's increased resistance against breaking down into sludge and corrosive products. Again, parts are examined for deposits, possible bearing corrosion and ring sticking. One of the best proofs of a motor oil's quality is provided in this extensive lineup of automobile test engines, the 36-hour high temperature engine test. Determined here is the oil's resistance to oxidation in severe service. At the completion of the test, parts are carefully studied by expert observers and rated for varnish deposits, sludge deposits, and bearing corrosion. Now our tough little hero, thoroughly qualified, is ready for all types of lubrication. No matter where or what the job is, wherever or however metal slides on metal, our hero, the little lubricating oil molecule, faithfully meets all requirements. So tiny in size that he cannot be seen. So tremendous an effect that the mechanized life we know today could not go on without him. Yes, in every situation or kind of operation, that calls for lubrication, you'll find the likes of me. Where the jobs are simple, 